Hi there. Thanks for taking the trouble to drop by. I'm Keith Ginsberg, and in this video, I look at the Russian avant-garde and touch on its connections with Western European modernist art movements. I do this through looking at the work of three artists, El Lysitsky, Alexandra Rodchenko, and Lyubov Popova. Their work is absolutely sensational. I know you're going to love looking at it. So, enough of the introductions, let's crack on. Eliezer Markovich Lysitsky, known as El Lysitsky, was born in the small Jewish town of Pochinok. But he didn't spend his childhood there. He lived and studied in the city of Vitebsk, the significance of which will become clear later. He began his artistic career illustrating children's Yiddish books, which he incorporated Hebrew letters into a distinctively Art Nouveau style. Here's a very early example of his work. And it reminds me quite a lot of Chagall's work, Lysitsky's friend from Vitebsk. His illustrations for the children's poem, One Little Kid, allow us to see his political beliefs on show as he depicts the angel of death wearing the Tsar's crown. His book cover, for the children's story Four Billy Goats in 1919 shows a dramatic development in his style and demonstrates his brilliance at typography. The red, white and black palette, the repeat of the number four in Western, Roman and Hebrew alphabets, the four circles, the four lines are all set on a powerful and energetic diagonal. Before the revolution in 1917, Elzitsky had studied architectural engineering at Darmstadt in Germany. He travelled widely throughout Europe, spending a lot of time in France and Italy, in the company of other Russian students, artists and poets. One can almost imagine the free life, visiting galleries, going to parties, exchanging new ideas, meeting new people, a very different environment from that which he had left behind in repressive Tsarist Russia. And in 1919, Chagall invited Elder Zitsky to Vitebsk to teach uh, graphic arts, printing and architecture at the newly formed People's Art School, which became known as UNOVIS. The year before, Chagall had organised the Vitebsk Museum of Modern Art, which became famous for academic realism, the avant-garde and suprematism. Kazimir Malevich succeeded Chagall as the director and El Lysitsky became the most important artist to adopt his ideas and forms in his work and follow the doctrines of suprematism. So what is suprematism? Well, it's an art movement focused on the basic geometric forms such as circles, squares, lines and rectangles painted in a limited range of colours. Let's look at it by look at some of Malevich's own work. Malevich said, in trying to liberate art from the ballast of the representational world, I sought refuge in the form of the square. 
During the Russian Civil War, after the revolution, L. Lysitsky produced this amazing piece of propagandist art. From our vantage point today, it's quite easy to decode this work. The reds are on the left, the whites are on the right. The wedge, a symbol of change, represents the Red Army and is piercing the circle, a form that represents unchanging conservatism, i.e. the White Army. Confusion is created by the small shapes, basic forms combined with the captions in text. Typography and art are fused. This work is on the edge of a three-dimensional visual plane. We are familiar with this language. We're quite used to seeing it, but can you imagine the impact this would have had on the streets of Moscow in 1919. His prune compositions combined architectural cues and three-dimensional space with the two-dimensional imagery and suprematist language. And although they contain basic shapes, they exist on shifting axes and multiple perspectives. Victory Over the Sun was a Russian futurist opera about a group who wanted to destroy reason by disposing of time and capturing the sun. El Lysitsky produced posters and designs for a suprematist remake of this opera. El Nozitsky's fame and reputation and influence grew and in 1921 he was appointed the cultural ambassador to Weimar Germany where he worked and influenced the Bauhaus and de Stahl movements. The Bauhaus, founded in 1919 in Weimar by an architect, Walter Gropius, held a radical concept to reimagine the material world to reflect the unity of all the arts. The movement owed much to El Zitsky, I think. His paintings were like plans for imaginary cities seen from above, and with their intersecting planes, precise crystalline space organised around the diagonal, they were way stations between painting, sculpture and architecture. And the de Staal movement from 1917, originally a Dutch movement, was based around the reduction of the essential of both form and colour. Theo van Doesburg, its founder, collaborated with El Lazitsky in Weimar, and the influence is clear to see. Later, he included constructivist influences, which leads me to look at our next two artists.
Lyubov Popova and Alexander Vrachenko were leading figures in the Russian avant-garde from the 1917 revolution to Popova's early death in 1924 at the age of 35. Popova launched her painterly architectronics as early as 1915 at an exhibition called 0.10, the last futurist exhibition. She was inventing her own formula of non-objective art. She united the shapes of cubist and futurist morphology with an adaptation of the suprematist vocabulary. But she was unique. She partially liquefied the hard edges and pushed forms to the edge and corners of the picture frame. Alexander Rodchenko used single lines to construct designs in which angles are used to create the abstract from the ordinary. His use of line allowed him to largely exclude colour, form and to an extent composition. His constructivism was linked to tangible and concrete ideas rather than abstract ideas. These magazine covers showcase Lyubov's mastery of dramatic typography, graphic design and extraordinary creativity. She produced various designs for constructivist clothes using the rectangle, the square and the triangle and was a prodigious textile designer. She said, no single artistic success gave me such profound satisfaction as the sight of a peasant woman buying a piece of my fabric. To me, they bring to mind Mondrian's work and her clothes were rediscovered decades later. Elzitsky was one of the most controversial and experimental artists to work in the Russian avant-garde in the early years of the 20th century. Equally prolific as a painter, a designer, an architect, a photographer, he connected countries and cultures, promoting suprematism and constructivism in the West and introducing Western ideas back into Russia. Working with the Russian painter and theoretician Kazimir Malevich, he developed the new visual language of suprematism, abstract art based on pure artistic feeling rather than the depiction of objects. And he applied that not only to painting, but also to print and book works, architectural and theatre projects, ceramics, and educational theory and propaganda. For El Lizitsky, art was not conceived as an act of personal creative expression, but rather as a social activity and a collective activity. The avant-garde artists Lyubov Popova and Alexander Rodchenko were significant for their role in imbuing everyday life with the aesthetic of the avant-garde. The concept of the painter as an isolated creator was replaced by constructivism, which gave concrete form to the new visual language. They held the conviction that art could play a key role in the transformation of the everyday and the reconstruction of society. Andrachenko said, the quest for construction has led the artist 
through a stage of experimentation with spatial structures to the design of actual things. And Popova said, connection with the socio-political moment in which we're living is a principle for any creative activity. Well, <clears throat> far be it from me to disagree with Lyubov Popova, but I think art can transcend the connection with the socio-political moment. The art of the Russian Guard may have been seeded and grown in the years before the Russian Revolution of 1917, but its flower lives with us today, bringing joy and understanding to our very different world. Well, I told you the work would be sensational. I hope you really enjoyed looking at it. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to hit the like button. And if you haven't already, do subscribe to this channel. As always, I'm available at ginsberg.co.uk where you can find all the links to my channels and sites there. So, thanks once again for dropping by and I hope to see you again soon.